All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, I'm Ryan Lane of Wikimedia Foundation. I'm joined today by Tim Bell of CERN and JC Martin from eBay. And we're going to be discussing um, the OpenStack User Committee. And we're going to be giving some information about uh, feedback and metrics from the survey that we've conducted. <clears throat> so um, who here is familiar with what we're actually supposed to be doing to begin with with the OpenStack User Committee? Good. So now you will, hopefully. <laughs> so um, when the foundation was formed uh, in the bylaws, it was uh, one of the things that was brought up in the bylaws is that a user committee would be founded. And <clears throat> from that, um, the board of directors would appoint one member. The technical committee would appoint an another member. Um, the board appointed Tim Bell, um, the user committee I'm sorry, the technical committee appointed myself, and the bylaws said that we would appoint a third member, and that is JC Martin of eBay. <clears throat> and from there, we would create the initial user committee. So um, the initial scope that we're looking at, first of all, is that we're going to define the bylaws, the actual structure of the committee. That's uh, the first thing that we have to do. I'm going to go into more information about that soon. Um, the next thing that we're, we were going to do is to define the actual types of users that we're going to be representing. Um, third, we're going to take information from the users as a whole, and we're going to aggregate this information, and we're going to present this um, with actionable proposals to the technical committee and the board of directors. Next, we're going to take information from these users, and we're going to um, track what they're doing, um, how they're using the software, in the software, what things they're using, like if they're using KVM, if when they're using Nova, or if they're using Zen, or when they're consuming the APIs, if they're using like XML format or JSON. And then we can take these things and we can present aggregate stats and also be able to take these and, and provide them as information back to the technical committee, to the developers, et cetera. Um, last, we're going to work with the managers of the the user groups that are currently in place globally around the world. Um, and we're going to help them make their user groups more, uh, they were gonna help strengthen them and make the entire system kind of work better. So the actual structure itself. Um, we've been working on this for the past few months. We have an, a, a document online that um, will be in the slides. We'll be sharing the slides later as well with links to where you can go and actually see how the structure works. Um, but I'll give you a quick overview. Um, first of all, the structure of the committee is to have a number of representatives in the user community that um, will represent the user community as a whole. And this means um, that we'll have members that are representing all of the different types of users that we've defined over the market segments that we're defining, as well as over all of the ge geographical regions that we're also defining in the um, our documentation. Um, so with this, obviously, the, the community or the committee can probably grow pretty large in this. Because if we have a very large number of types of users and a very large set of geographical regions with uh, a lot of market segments, then the committee can become pretty unwieldy. And uh, what we want to do is kind of limit the size of this to make it kind of manageable while still having it large enough to properly um, represent the community as a whole. So we have a number of things where we're limiting the size. Um, the first one is that we're only going to allow one um, representative per company that is being represented total. Um, this is to ensure diversity. Um, it could be that we have one company that has um, that actually covers very large numbers of market segments over a very large number of geog geographical regions, but we feel that it's better to have um, individual members from different companies that are representing all of these things so that we get more input and better input from the community. Um, <clears throat> next, we're going to limit the number of representatives that we have from any single market segment, and as well, we're going to limit the number of uh, representatives that we have in any geographical region. But in that limitation for geographical, uh, geographical region, the way that we're looking at doing this is to have um, the representation be roughly proportional to the size of the representation in those geographical regions. 
So um, regions that have a very large number of users are going to have more representation. Um, we've already gotten a little bit of feedback on that, saying that it, just, it may not be terribly fair to some regions. Um, that's why we're saying it's going to be roughly proportional. So some regions that we feel have the potential for very large amounts of growth will probably have a larger um, representation than other portions. Also, um, there's two seats that are reserved. There's one that can be appointed by the board of directors, and there's another that can be appointed by the technical committee. Um, the initial way that we're going to bring community members in is that we're going to appoint them. Um, originally, we wanted to do elections for these, and we got a lot of feedback from the board saying that for the initial set of the process, it's probably going to be too slow to do elections. And we want to get the committee set up and actually bring in data and being able to present these things. So um, we'll probably set up the initial committee by having appointments for all of the positions. And then after a certain period of time, we're thinking probably maybe a year or six months, that we will hold elections for all of the positions that are currently there. And people will have to actually try to get elected for the positions they've been appointed to. Um, once all of these folks are elected or appointed, um, we will have a chair and a vice chair that will be um, elected from a voting process inside of the committee itself. So um, going back to the actual types of users, I think this is something we can all relate to. We're all users, right? Who here is a user? Excellent. So. Now I get to categorize all of you. The first type of user that we have is a consumer. These are people that are using cloud services that are OpenStack cloud services. And this could be people that are using storage, cloud storage, or cloud uh, virtualization services, et cetera. Or this would also be people that are consuming the API, but not specifically people that are building software and services using the API that are um, using the build for OpenStack trademark. That's something separate. The next group is the operators. This is the people that are actually running the software. I fall into this category. Um, so far, I think this is the, the group of people that we've gotten the most feedback from total. Operations engineers love to complain. I should know. I love to complain. Um, <clears throat> Next is the ecosystem partners. This is specifically the group of people that are writing software and services that are using the built for OpenStack trademark and are held by those uh, requirements. Lastly, we have distribution providers or application vendors. These are like Red Hat, SUSE, um, Canonical, Piston Cloud, and other groups of people who are making OpenStack distributions and or making appliances and things like that. So the current status. Uh, we have the initial members. That would be the three of us. Um, we all have NDA signed. So any of the information that is shared with us is private within our own group. We don't share it outside of the user committee at all. Um, any of the survey information that comes in only comes to us. We provide only aggregate statistics. Same with any of the other information that's shared with us. <clears throat> This is also another reason that we have to kind of limit the size of the committee, because every committee member is required to sign an NDA. We've also created a mailing list. Currently, this mailing list is um, set up where anyone can subscribe and read, but only the committee, uh, only the committee members can actually post to the list. So um, we're looking at changing this, possibly, to instead um, make the process more open uh, to where anyone can post. Um, we're still for kind of figuring this out, so if anyone wants to talk to us about how you think we can better work communication pathways, we'd love to be, uh, to, to involve you. Lastly, we're uh, finishing up the structure, which is why we're presenting it to you now. And um, also, we've started collecting information with the foundation, and um, this is more than just the survey. This is also... Uh-oh. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> um, this is like the membership directory. Um, basically, we have uh, we're going to have a centralized system that has that holds all of the information for everything in the foundation, and we'll use this system to access data 
and provide, like create the statistics and aggregate data and such. Um, the thing that we've done that we're gonna be presenting on soon is the initial user survey. Um, this is also going to feed into this system. I don't think it currently is. Is, is it currently feeding in? Oh good, it is currently feeding into the system, so. Um, so that should help us. Um, we have a number of priorities for 2013, not working anymore. So the first of all, and the most important thing is this for actually, for us to get the committee set up and working. Um, after that, we're gonna start expanding the membership by doing the appointments. Um, next, we're going to look at all of the data that we've collected, and we're gonna start forming a comprehensive view of the community so that we can actually give reliable feedback to the board and to the technical committee. Um, lastly, we're gonna set up the communication pathways. Uh, the first is gonna be changing how the list works or um, setting up a new list or something along these lines so that we can take active feedback from the community that's public. But we also need to set up communication pathways that are private. So for organizations that are not necessarily willing to say that they're running OpenStack or not willing to divulge some information about their clouds, they have a way to provide us with information and such. Um, lastly, we're gonna provide metrics, which is coming up next. I don't think this is working anymore. Working. Okay, great. So, um, in March, we ran a, a survey, um, emailing out through the foundation to the various members, uh, tweeting, um, contacting various people. Um, and the survey would allow people to come onto the foundation site. Um, they didn't necessarily need to be members of the foundation. People could also just register just for the purpose of the survey. And with that, they could give us their feedback. Um, we were pleased to have 400 plus uh, answers. Um, and with that, it was intriguing to see the distribution of the, the geographies. So as, un, as expected, the US uh, was a substantial chunk. Um, after that, Asia, so uh, India and China. And then two surprises for me, which was uh, France and Germany uh, next. Um, after that, there's a huge tail. So we're talking about 56 countries uh, overall. It demonstrates the global aspects of the, the community. At the same time, when we asked people to classify what kind of user they were, so we clearly had a large number of cloud operators. Um, this is understandable given the current state of the project. Um, not so many cloud consumers. Um, we aren't expecting that the people that are using the public clouds or the private clouds are going to be the ones currently involved in this in terms of the communication paths tended to favor those people who were related to the openstack.org uh, site, members of the foundation. And then after that, some answers from service providers and ecosystem vendors. So we've got a fair distribution there which confirms much the approach that says we want a balanced user committee that's allowed to represent all those different perspectives. When we come down to company size, things split roughly one third, one third, one third uh, between the different sizes. So uh, below 200 uh, employees, one third, between 200 and 1,000, another third, and then, whoops, and then the big guys, um, which are over 1,000. Oh, get to read your mail. <laughs> Um, and then when we come to the industries where people are involved, so clearly information technology comes out uh, highly, um, a fair chunk of the academic research, telecommunications is getting to be increasingly a significant market. And a fair number of government and defense um, replies. What was interesting on the, the industries aspect is that many users who are working for the same companies actually define themselves in different sections. Um, one of the difficulties with the surveys is always that unless you write a massive user manual that comes along with the survey explaining the finer details of every single answer, which probably no one will read, you won't get completely consistent answers. So we should look at this in terms of the total statistics rather than in terms of an individual answer as being so, so significant. And that's why getting over 400 answers is good because it allows us to be reasonably confident in the ratios that we're seeing. Yeah. 
So in this case, we asked just what area of uh, industry do you work in? Um, and we gave them a set of classifications like healthcare and finance. Um, so in this case, it would be companies whose involvement is in the information technology industry. So amongst the other things we asked the users for, along with their uh, industries, their geographies, um, was what things they actually wanted as far as further enhancements goes to the product. Um, this was a free text field, and we had over 190 answers. So people spent effort to give us this feedback, which is greatly appreciated. Um, the one that came out top, this is in priority order. Um, so out of the 190, probably around 20 people were mentioning installation and configuration difficulties. Um, after that, the next one that came in was migrations. In particular, how we go about migrating from one version to another version without any downtime. Documentation um, was a key item. Um, some people wrote just documentation, documentation, documentation as the, the feedback. Um, <laughs> and in particular, some of the comments were actually not to provide more, but to provide easy ways under which you can get at the latest copy. It's also easy to drop into Google and pick up the cactus documentation of the command line. Um, so we need to find ways under which we can mark documentation as archived. And so even though there may be some instances that are running that version, that makes it clear that people should go somewhere else in order to get the info. Security, clearly a, an important item, and in particular, making sure that the basic communications and infrastructures can be encrypted. Horizon came up quite frequently. Um, people were often encountering that there was a new feature that's coming out. But when it comes out, Horizon wasn't there on day one with the support for that feature. They needed to wait until the next release. High availability. Um, so here, it wasn't clear what people meant. They just said high availability. Um, some people were more explicit and said, we want the Nova uh, infrastructure to be highly available. Others were clearly meaning virtual machine high availability, restart a virtual machine after a hypervisor crash. And then finally, Active Directory. So at the end, probably the Active Directory one, we had three or four people who were saying that to give you a feeling of the kind of curve. The second question we asked people to fill out was on the foundation priorities. So this is separate from what you want from the product. What do you want the foundation to be organizing, both foundation staff, the board, the technical committee, and the user committee? And here, top item by a long way was to ensure compatibility between OpenStack clouds. Secondly, to look at stability and hardening, not just improving uh, the underlying function. So get in there and work out those places that are causing us pain when we're running these clouds in production and fix the underlying root cause of the problems, not just add on additional function. Certification and training, um, putting in place the sort of infrastructure that you get commonly now around the Linux distributions so that you can get certification for the engineers, so you can get the full range of training options from an early start uh, engineer right up to the specialist and guru and then work through with the user groups, especially outside the US. Um, you can see this clearly from the stats that there is a wide distribution uh, of user groups across the US, but then when we get outside of the US, it starts to become a bit more patchy. And there we need to work through the user communities and try to identify how to encourage user groups around the rest of the world. Over to JC. Thanks. So as part of the survey, uh, there was a question, uh, optional question, uh, for people to fill out a description of their deployments. Um, there's uh, multiple deployments possible per uh, user. So what you are seeing here is that there's almost 200 deployments, and um, uh, it's likely that there will be less than half of the users who filled out their deployments. There was an option for uh, people also to specify if their deployment was public or private, meaning do they want to share the information about their deployment? And we are taking that very seriously. If someone is telling us that they are fine uh, sharing their deployment data, but they don't want to share it outside of the user committee, 
we are going to make sure that this is uh, ensured because that's kind of the trust that we want to build so that we can collect as much as possible the information from the users. So when we looked at the, the deployments, uh, as Tim was saying, it's difficult to put a user manual with the, the, the survey so that people fill out the survey correctly. Uh, so we ended up with uh, some uh, types of um, discrepancies where people would check all the boxes or uh, they would uh, basically say that uh, multiple incompatible uh, answers were selected. So uh, bear that in mind. But the, the clear thing that we can see is that the, the main type of deployment that we got was the on-premise private cloud. So what it means is that people were deploying OpenStack in-house on their own infrastructure. The, the other type of uh, on, uh, private cloud was hosted. So for example, you are uh, with Vario or other um, hosting companies or Rackspace and you're running uh, your OpenStack cloud there. And uh, the last um, big chunk was the public cloud. So uh, we then asked users to categorize what stage they were um, in for their deployment. And that's where uh, we got uh, multiple answers, which kind of um, is, is weird because you cannot be at the same time POC and production. But um, uh, we can see that the highest uh, number of deployments were in dev QA and proof of concept, but a fair chunk was in production. So th that's interesting. And the, the notion of production also uh, um, doesn't exclude the fact that you can do dev and QA on the same cloud. So for example, at eBay, that's what we are doing. We are de deploying the next version on our previous uh, version. So it could also be uh, the reason why people checked uh, multiple uh, boxes. Uh, with regard to the version, almost half of the deployments were on Folsom. Uh, and that's great because it means that people are upgrading their cloud. There's only 5% on Diablo. so. The good thing is that there's no uh, CACTI or a previous version, but there's still 5% on, on Diablo. So um, maybe uh, it's back to uh, what Tim was saying, is that upgrading OpenStack is very hard right now. And, and we, we had uh, at eBay to develop a tool to even migrate uh, VMs between versions because the upgrade between uh, SX and Folsom was not uh, easy. And um, it's clear when, for example, you have new projects like Quantum becoming part of the mainstream, it's creating a lot of disruption and people might not be able to upgrade as much as possible. The other interesting part is that there's uh, almost 10% of people running the trunk, which is like maybe uh, in their CI, CD type of uh, um, project where they, they run uh, the latest version. Uh, we asked then users or uh, the, uh, yeah, users, uh, what features they were offering. And um, you can see that the dashboard is coming up um, uh, high, but uh, the interesting thing for me at least was that the compatibility with EC2 and S3 was last. So it means that maybe people are less interested of having like an Amazon-like cloud than having something that uh, they run internally. So th that's uh, an interesting uh, point. Uh, in terms of components that users were running, uh, the, the main Components are up there, right? Like Nova, uh, Glance, Keystone, Horizon, the four main components. And then uh, the interesting thing is that Quantum and Cinder, which are new, uh, coming just uh, in Folsom and, and um, Grizzly, are already uh, deployed quite a bit. So that's an interesting point. And Silometer and Heat, they are even not uh, main project right now, and they are still uh, having some deployment. So it, lo it looks like the, um, even uh, if a project is in the uh, inception or um, incubation phase, as uh, user, we still uh, use them because there's value uh, for those projects. Or maybe they are just the users that develop that project that are listed there, I don't know. So the next, um, we lo looked at the detailed features. So what it means is that we double clicked on all those components and said, what driver uh, or what version do you use? So the key thing here is KVM is big. So either because it's the default uh, hypervisor and it was the only well-supported hypervisor for uh, a while, but um, you can see that uh, the other ones are less than 10% each uh, of the, the, the deployments. Then we asked users what storage drivers they were using. And here, um, it's a bit clearer. The, the, 
surprise for me, at least, was the Ceph RBD uh, uh, part. Um, LVM and NFS are kind of obvious. Um, th they seem to be the easy path to um, use uh, storage drivers. But um, Ceph is not like a, an easy uh, deployment, so that was surprising. For network drivers, um, the, the interesting part is that there's as many uh, open vSwitch deployment as there's Linux bridge, which is it's nice. Uh, it's nice to see. Um, it's maybe because now Linux uh, adopted open vSwitch as a core project, so uh, people are starting to be more comfortable using it. Cisco has a big part of the drivers or so, which is nice. And then the, there's the other um, others that are uh, there. Identity driver, um, Ryan was surprised that LDAP was uh, used because like, it looks like you have problems with LDAP or no one was answering your uh, LDAP questions. So, but still there, there's a third of the users that are deploying LDAP for their identity driver. And in terms of APIs, uh, JSON is a big winner, which is nice, I prefer JSON than XML. Um, the next part, what we did is we looked at the scale, but because there were so many POC deployments, I removed those uh, POC deployments out of the, the numbers because they were kind of skewing the numbers down to the, the smallest deployment, and it's not very representative of um, what people will run in production because they tend to try a lot of features, for example, on the POC than they would in production. So there's still a lot of um, small clouds there, like less than 50 hypervisors, right? And uh, it's 70% of our clouds, which means that in terms of maturity, um, we will see a lot more skew toward smaller cloud and users that are less sophisticated in operating a cloud, because when you operate 50 nodes, it's less difficult than operating thousands. But you can see that um, in terms of number of uh, nodes, uh, you have almost 5% above 1,000 nodes, which is interesting. So there's the two spectrums. There will be a large community of users that is interested in starting using a cloud and deploying to scale. And then there's a population of very sophisticated users that are already running a very large cloud uh, at scale. So number of scores and instances are proportional. Um, so I think that we have to keep in mind the, the two populations when we, we look at the, the needs and the requirements. I think that they will, this will be important. Uh, Cinder deployment, same thing, removed the POC uh, deployments. But, and you can see that, again, almost 50%, uh, very small deployments, less than 10 terabytes of storage. But uh, on the other end, um, there is very large users with more than 500 terabytes. So, so very wide spectrum there. Last one is Swift. Um, there's 47 deployment of Swift um, with outside of POC, which is interesting. Smaller deployment, 50% almost. But then there, there, there's a very large deployment, uh, like um, more than 500 terabytes of um, uh, object storage, uh, almost 10% of the users. And uh, on the, the number of objects, there's almost 5% with more than 100 million objects. So that uh, means that Swift being maybe more mature than some of the, the other Nova components, you see a lot more uh, large deployments of Swift than maybe other um, components. So the survey is still open. And uh, we will do kind of a rolling upgrade or rolling update of the survey data as we get more data. And uh, we'll try to maybe clean up the, the forms to make sure that multi-selection is maybe disabled in some answers so that we force people to split their deployments in multiple instances instead of uh, cramming everything on one uh, deployment um, survey. And if you have any feedback on the survey, um, when we open the, the mailing list for general contribution, uh, you will be able to uh, give us your feedback or ask uh, clarifying questions on, on those. So it's, again, it's an initial um, evaluation of the numbers. There's uh, other things that we can do with the numbers, like for example, um, all the numbers are presented 
per uh, deployment, but not per the number of instance. So for example, uh, how many um, uh, KVM uh, deployments, uh, actually instance, uh, would be an interesting uh, data to get. Like, we know that there's like 50% of the deployments that are using KVM, but how many instances does it represent if, for example, a very large cloud is using Zen, right? So that's something that we will do uh, next, and I'll double click on some of those numbers and do more pivoting and correlation between numbers. Yes? No, so uh, that's one of the, the issue that we had also is sometimes there's, uh, so the user survey, you, you had multiple uh, uh, users uh, giving their uh, feedback. Um, for the deployments, um, we, it, it worked very well. There was no um, duplicates, but uh, I don't know if it was enforced, in fact. that people could do was to put a description um, when they defined their deployment. And so we went over the data and removed the cases where there were multiple descriptions that were identical. Um, so the aim was to avoid scenarios where you had uh, two reports of exactly the same deployment. Yeah, we did a bit of cleanup also. On, we removed some of the, the answers where people checked all the box. Yeah, they were very excited about the survey. But, I mean, as JC mentioned, so I mean, anyone who hasn't done it already, it would be very helpful to fill out your deployments um, as part of the survey, since that data is going to be an ongoing data set that we will carry on maintaining. But maybe what's important is if you know that some other people, like it, it could happen in very large company that you don't know uh, if someone already filled the, the deployment for your organization. Um, maybe it's good to coordinate maybe among yourselves to make sure that uh, we don't have to do the filtering. And because the, the worst is when you don't have the same answers. You have the same deployment from the same company with different <laughs> answers. Yeah. Or you're using Folsom. No, I'm using SX. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we will try to avoid that. Um, so one of the things we ran into when we were writing the Question is, can uh, like an example of something like a merge out of the metrics you collected, and should uh, essentially that data type become available? I think the, what we can report is in terms of what people are deploying. Um, I think there is a risk in that becoming a reference architecture, since it might not necessarily be the correct um, reference. Um, so clearly we are reflecting what people are deploying and therefore probably to what extent the operations guide should be assisting that. But I don't think that we should necessarily assume automatically, therefore the right answer is KVM, open vSwitch uh, for the reference yeah, architecture. I yeah. I mean, what we can say is we can say they're, they're, those are typical deployments. Or, or maybe like if you have a getting started uh, section where you, you want to look at... Um, getting people fast uh, with a uh, running cloud, it's likely that like the um, those drivers, like drivers that have the most um, response will be the one that people uh, will want to run first. So like selecting, a, I don't know, a big switch driver uh, would not be the best uh, option for someone trying to, to get started. So. Default, default, right? Right. Probably the kind of recommendation that the technical committee should uh, give, rather than the user committee or coming out of this data. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah. So that we're providing the data so that maybe the te technical committee can do this kind of thing. Because I mean, this is also not necessarily the kind of thing that individual projects should do either, right? It's something that's a reference implementation across all of the different projects saying these are the things that are best supported and this, these are the configuration options. It may be that it's not a specific rep, uh, 
a, a specific re uh, reference implementation. Maybe it's like for these specific types of environments, these are the ones that we're uh, recommending. But they, these are definitely kind of things that a technical committee would be best at doing rather than user committee. Yeah, I think that's why uh, what Ryan was saying is that this group <laughs> will influence the technical committee by providing the data. And I think that if it's a feedback loop and, and we get to see the recommendation and someone says, oh, you have to use this vendor or XYZ as the default, we'll say, okay, it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. I, individual vendors can make their own reference guides and that's perfectly fine. Everyone has their own ability to do so and their own marketing. But um, it's probably not something that we would um, su support. And as in the fact, normal maybe the, the most sensible default would be the open source uh, defaults. Yes. Not like a vendor specific, because then you are biased to a vendor. Right? I'm, I'm not seeing that coming from the user committee. I mean, I, I think the, the user committee is there to represent the views of the users back to the technical committee and to the management board. Um, it isn't there to enforce uh, a, a kind of technical implementation. Hmm. Right, so therefore, the, what the user committee can do is to raise the fact that there is a concern, there is, so there is a need for a reference design and take that back to the technical committee and the management board as input from the user community. Um, it's not for the user committee to be defining that, it's more a question of raising the concerns of the users to the bodies so that can then get on and solve them. The documentation and um, the, like, the operator guide, is it out of the technical side or the... Like, who is res which body, if you want, is responsible for those? Technical. The technical committee. Yeah. But they, they are part of the technical side. Of part of the technical side, yeah. yeah. I think that's maybe one that's rather a bit the, the two sides. Yeah. Right. yeah. 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 They, they need to work closely with the user committee, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so the, the yeah. aim would be that in something like 12 months time, um, we will then produce a, uh, a new report. So from this data, we'll be doing a write-up, which will include more. We only had a week to do the, uh, the data processing, so um, it was somewhat hurried. Um, but we will then go into a more extended uh, description with that, and then we would look to be repeating that on something like a yearly basis. That's what we'd hope, yeah. Now, with people hopefully filling out the, the survey as things progress, then we could even be making it for basic statistics on a smaller granularity. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing. I think now that we're opening up the, uh, the lists, then we can have that kind of discussion amongst the people that would like to get involved. Yeah, and that's where maybe the double click by doing some more pivoting, like for example, uh, we presented the operator, but all the data that are coming after that, uh, those, that slide is global data. But if you say, okay, operator, how did they answer the survey? Or uh, this, uh, like, uh, for a private cloud, how did they answer the survey? So that's the, the next double click that we can do and it, it will influence your persona a bit more than what we have right now.
There was I, something. I think right? Josh McKenty had started so, on doing something. So we've like this. had some prototyping of something like that, and certainly one of the things that is clear from the comments is that some people were making, uh, oh, this is a problem, this is a problem. Um, however, if we then ask the uh, community overall to be starting to vote to say, yeah, this is something that is my top priority, then that input would be very useful. So what I hope to be able to do is to take the comments and produce a first 10 initial seeding proposals and then start to get input from everyone in terms of documentation is the number one or installation and configuration is the number one. And then we can take those items as being the things to the technical committee and the management board to be looking at how to fund and how to solve. And I, I think this, this is actually a very important thing because currently the only way that we can really take feedback or the only way that we're really getting feedback right now is mostly from the developer lists. Um, the IRC channels seem to be mostly dead for support and um, a lot of the other input mechanisms that we have for taking uh, input from regular users that are not developers is, is not, they're, none of them are very good right now and working. So um, ask.opensource.org, yes. It's new. So hopefully that will help as well. But um, we definitely need to be able to take feedback in a number of different ways. That's probably very good for support, but it might not be as good for figuring out what users actually need from features. So, yeah. And I think in particular, the thing that I'd like is to be able to have people who can say what their pain points are without knowing necessarily what the solution is. Um, so many of the people uh, using OpenStack won't know that the fix is to be re-architecting this component, but they will know that this doesn't work. Yes. We're hoping the opposite, that you would help us. <laughs> yeah. It, really, we're looking at more having a, a feedback mechanism where um, the user groups can collect feedback and tell us the problems that people in their areas are having. I mean, the interaction between the committee and the user groups is one of those things that I'd like to be having a, a number of coffees with a number of people uh, during this week as well. Um, because getting that structure in place, given that the user groups are the local contact, is very important. And that's the way to scale, because we are only three yeah, for now. Right. So. Yeah. Um, you, you have the local contact, you have the cultural links. Um, so from that point of view, that is a key part of uh, getting that feedback loop in place. Good. Okay, yeah. great. So well, thanks, thanks for coming along, and uh, I'll, I'll be right up sending it around.